Welcome once again to the People of the Free Gift podcast, where we ground believers in their identity in Christ and equip them to reach out to those caught in religion. We're glad you joined us. We are following along with Jesus, and last week we went uh, to the Jordan River to see him baptized by John the Baptist, and we found that that was the inauguration of his ministry, truly, Uh, It was a confirmation from God himself of Jesus' identity and his role. And it was a confirmation to John the Baptist. It was a confirmation to everyone who was there and watching. And what we're going to talk about today is the temptation of Jesus. Uh, Immediately following his baptism in the Jordan River, we find that the Holy Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil for 40 days and 40 nights. And so let's go ahead and jump right in. Like we did last week, I'm going to take uh, Matthew's account in Matthew 4, verse 1 through 11, if you want to follow along there. But what I've done is I've uh, added in the details that Mark and Luke include in their accounts uh, that bring a fuller uh, insight into the passage. And so here we go. And Matthew chapter 4, Then Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness with the wild beasts to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, he was afterward hungry. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then the devil, taking him up into Jerusalem, the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you, to keep you in their hands. They shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone." Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And again the devil took him up into an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time and the glory of them. And the devil said unto him, All these things and all this power will I give you, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If you therefore will worship me, all shall be thine." Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. And so we get uh, the first picture here. Uh, It raises more of a question in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was driven by the Spirit into the wilderness with the wild beasts to be tempted of the devil. And it begs the question, why is the Holy Spirit leading Jesus toward temptation? I mean, after all, we pray uh, things like in the Lord's Prayer, Matthew 6, 13, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And in James 1, 13, we're told that let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. So why does it say that Jesus, being full of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit actually drives him into the wilderness? And the, the word actually, you know, can be translated, he's thrown out into the wilderness. Um, and Mark actually adds in the, the detail that with the wild beast, left for dead, right? I mean, I, you know, and it's co- quite a contrast that This is the same Holy Spirit last week that we saw was the sign, the Holy Spirit that descended like a dove and remained upon Jesus. It was that very Holy Spirit that then, that was served as a confirmation of his identity that then throws him out into the wilderness. And this must have been a little bit jarring for Jesus uh, to go from such a spiritual high, uh, such a great, grandiose moment that could it you know, seem like you could build on that, and all of a sudden he finds himself alone. 
and fasting for 40 days in the wilderness. And hold on to that question that is raised. Why did the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into temptation? Uh, because we're going to get to that in a minute here. But then we go on to verse 2. And it says, And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. And my comment on that one is, don't try this at home. And I say that kind of tongue-in-cheek, but the truth is, I read a book on fasting, and really when you're talking 40 days and 40 nights, you're talking pushing the physical boundaries of what your body can handle. It's at the point, um, most people would even reach this point before this, but it's the point in which your body actually starts feeding off of its, itself. You, you literally are starving. Don't take this lightly. If you're, you feel led by the Lord to fast um, for a season, then please talk to a doctor unless you're just talking about fasting for a day or something like that. But um, it's not something that you should take lightly. It's not something that's just you can assume that God's going to give you supernatural abilities to do this and transcend what your body normally can handle. Please consult a doctor. Don't try this at home. Little disclaimer. And then we get into verse 3. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God. And this introduces us into Satan's tactic. Uh, Satan is quite clever, but he's not so clever that uh, he's actually quite predictable. And in fact, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. And in fact, if you, if you actually just study the Word of God and every time Satan appears on the scene, if you look at the different things that he does, he's actually quite predictable in what he's going to do. And so let's get into that a little bit. And um, so when he says, if you are the Son of God, there's two theories about this. And notice it's the very first thing, as soon as Satan appears on the scene, the very first thing he says to Jesus is, if you are the Son of God. And you might remember from last week, the words that came from God out of heaven, which he parted, um, were, this is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. And in saying that, God confirmed for Jesus his identity and sealed forever his, his destiny, his purpose, and his direction. And from that moment on, that would be solidified. And so the very first thing that Satan does when he comes on the scene is he challenges that word of God. And so there's two theories, and it's because the word if in your English can mean it if, or since. And so one side would say that he was questioning Jesus' identity, which would be questioning the word of God. And that seems to be consistent if you look at the account of Adam and Eve in the book of Genesis and some other places. Whenever Satan comes on the scene, what he immediately wants to do is question what God has said. But also, even if it were, means since, since you are the son of God, what Satan would be doing would still be calling into question what God has said, and he would be asking Jesus to prove it. Either scenario would actually fit Satan's tactic quite well. In either case, he wants to challenge what God has said. And in doing so, if he can challenge what God has said, he actually challenges our identity. Because our identity is ultimately rooted and grounded in God's word and what God has said about us. And Satan always wants to point us somewhere else to find our identity. You know, point us to how good we are at certain things and, you know, certain hobbies or skills or if we're smart or if we're, you know, good looking or if we have a lot of money, if we're popular, all those types of things what kind of crowd do you fit in with? We look to all those things to judge our success. 
judge our identity, judge our worth and our value. And God is the one who speaks truth into our life and accepts us and secures us in who he has made us to be. And that's exactly what he had done for Jesus at his baptism. And now we find Satan calling that into question. And so then going on in verse 3, he says, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And this leads into a question of what is temptation? Because if you just look at this on the surface, Jesus has been fasting for 40 years. Days, something that I don't think most of us can even imagine. And all he asked him to do is to make stones into bread. It was something that was perfectly within his capability. And a lot of times we look at this from the standpoint of him being God, and we think, well, what would be wrong with that? Is it really a sin to turn stones into bread? And last week when we were talking about the baptism of Jesus, when he said Let us do this so that we can fulfill all righteousness. We found that Jesus was being led by the Holy Spirit. He was dependent upon the will of God and the power of the Holy Spirit for everything that he did. And so what is sinful about this, what is the temptation about this, is that he's asking him to test or put to the test his identity, that God has spoken the truth into his life, but he's calling him to utilize his divine powers outside of what God has told him to do and use those divine powers to perform a miracle. And that would have been sin for Jesus because God hadn't told him to do it. And Jesus was dependent upon everything he did, the will of God and the power of the Holy Spirit in order to make it happen. And the book of James tells us, it gives us a better insight into what temptation is. Now remember that question we were asking a second ago. Why is the Holy Spirit leading God, leading Jesus into temptation? Now, a lot of people stop with the quotation in James, and they say, well, God doesn't tempt anybody. But here's the fuller thing of what James actually says. In James chapter 1, verse 13, he says, Let no man say when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. But every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Everything about Satan is about getting you to give in to immediate gratification instead of waiting on God's provision to fulfill your deep desires. Your deep desires as a believer in Jesus Christ are placed there by God. Seek the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And what Satan always does is he wants to sell you short on something that God wants to do in your life. So he will come and he will take those very real and sincere and good desires and he will sell you short on them. And so here's what that looked like for Jesus. He just he was hungry, okay? So that's a real desire. And Satan comes along, and he gives them him an immediate out to that desire. Well, Jesus, come on now. This is simple. Turn the stone into bread. Satisfy your hunger. What are you doing out here? You're in the middle of the wilderness, but you have everything at your disposal. Why not do it? And so the temptation for Jesus was to act in his own strength instead of God's provision. And this was kind of trying to get Jesus on a simple one. 
Honestly, I mean, out of the three temptations that we're going to see coming, this was this would have get, gotten Jesus out on a really base desire, hunger. But there's an even deeper question here, and that is, how can Jesus be tempted if he's God? And I, I've had friends over the years who I've had good debates with them on this, and they insisted because Jesus was God that he literally could not be tempted. Because James even says, you know, God can't be tempted with evil. So if Jesus is God, like we talked about a few weeks ago, then how can he be tempted? That doesn't seem consistent. One thing you need to realize is that temptation is not sin. Temptation is the temptation to sin. It's only when you give in to the temptation that it becomes sin. And so temptation is not inconsistent with Jesus being God. Sinning would be inconsistent with Jesus being God. But you need to remember, like we talked about, yes, he's fully God, but he came to be fully one of us, to walk in our shoes, to be in our place. And the only way he could actually do that is if he was tempted just like we are and yet without sin. And so Jesus is fully God, fully man, and in his humanity, he really was tempted. And so we go on to verse 4, and it says, But he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Jesus' chosen defense was to quote the word of God. And in fact, all three of these quotations are from the book of Deuteronomy in the Old Testament. Two of them are from chapter 6, and and one of them is from chapter 8. And what he's quoting here is Moses in a sermon to the Israelites. He says that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And he's referring to something in the Israelites' past when he's talking about that. And that was the manna, the the bread that God fed them as they were in the wilderness. He supernaturally provided for their hunger. And for their needs. And so Jesus quotes a verse that's completely relevant to his situation, but also answers directly what Satan is trying to get him to do. It's, he's basically saying, look, God's going to provide for my needs, and this isn't the most important thing. Physical food isn't as important as living by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Now, think about this. What was the word of God that was spoken to Jesus? You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. He's basically saying to Satan, look, your whole questioning the word of God is where you're going wrong and where you fail. Because I believe it. And I'm secure in it. I'm secure in God's grace. He's well pleased with me. He will provide for me. I don't need you. Now, what's even more fun with this passage is if you, we just talked about Jesus' divine nature and his human nature. And what I like to do with this passage is I like to read it one time with, from his human perspective And then the next time I read it from the divine perspective. And what you find here, if you just think about what he just quoted to Satan in his defense, he says, you you don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And now think about it from the perspective of Jesus being God. And he's saying, Satan, you should be listening to me, not the other way around. You can look at this as like a call from Jesus to Satan to repentance. Now, angels can't repent, but he's calling Satan out on something. He's saying, Satan, you should be listening to me. I shouldn't be listening to you. Let's go on to verse 5. 
And it says, Then the devil taking him up into Jerusalem, the holy city, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, said unto him, If you be the Son of God, cast thyself down from here. Temptation number two, if you think about it, what was it that, what was the deep desire that Jesus had? He wanted people to follow him. He, he knew he was the son of God. He knew he was going to die for their sins. And he knew that he was the solution to every single problem, every single thing that we lost in Adam, he was going to be the fulfillment of. He was going to be the solution of. And so what Satan is tempting him to do is gain an instantaneous following. Think about it. He's on the pinnacle of the temple. It's one of the most visible sites in all of Jerusalem. And he takes him there. Now, how he takes them there, it doesn't say. It doesn't say that whether they literally went there or if he showed him a vision or just like instantaneously like they were there. It doesn't, it doesn't really tell us. But standing there on the pinnacle of the temple, what does Satan do? Verse 6, he says, For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning you to keep you in their hands. They shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Notice what Satan does. This way he was quoting Psalm 91. And I checked it. He's quoting it accurately. And so Satan says, hey, look, you want to quote scripture, Jesus, I can play this game. I know scripture too. Did you guys know that? Did you guys know that Satan knows his Bible? Satan knows his Bible and he knows it a lot better than you. He knows it well enough to where he can quote something that sounds really true. It sounds like that, well, that sounds like what it's saying. But he's a master of taking scripture out of context. And so Jesus kind of puts him back into context and he says, in verse seven, Jesus said unto him, it is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so his defense, Deuteronomy 6.16. And again, it's talking about, it's a sermon from Moses, and he's referring the Israelites back. They were complaining. They were in the wilderness, and God wasn't providing for their needs, at least from their perspective. And they were complaining that they were thirsty, and they were murmuring, and God says to Moses, what I want you to do is I want you to go to a rock and I want you to strike it and water is going to supernaturally flow out and it's going to provide for their needs. And Moses is pointing back in that sermon. He's saying, don't test the Lord your God like you did back there. Okay? And so... Think about this, okay, from the human perspective, Jesus puts Satan back into context. He puts scripture back into context. He properly divides the word of truth. And he says, look, yeah, it does say that in the Psalms, but that's not what it means, Satan. Because if I were to jump off of this pinnacle of the temple just to prove that, the, that angels would catch me, would be to test God. And that's something he calls us not to do. So that's not what he was intending by that verse. And in fact, if you read it in context, Satan, you would find out that he's talking about obeying all of the words of God. And if you obey all the words of God, then he will protect you and he will guide you. Those words, those guidelines, those principles will be a provision for you. But from a divine perspective, he's, think about what he says. Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Satan, you shouldn't be tempting me. You know who I am. You know that you're really, really overstepping 
your bounds. Verse 8. Again, the devil took him up into an exceeding high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in the moment in time and the glory of them. And the devil said unto him, All these things and all this power I will give thee and all the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And whomsoever I will, I give it. If you therefore will worship me, all shall be thine. And what was the temptation here? The temptation was kingdom without a cross. Jesus will come and establish his kingdom. It was promised by the angel Gabriel at his birth that he, she, he said to Mary, he will sit on the throne of his father David. That was a throne that didn't even exist in Jesus' day. And Jesus will one day come and set, establish his kingdom on the earth and he will fulfill all of those promises. But that's not why he came the first time. That's what everybody wanted. That's what the Jewish people wanted. They wanted freedom from the oppression of Rome. They wanted the reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel that was like under David and under Solomon. And they wanted Jesus so desperately. They tried so many times to make him king, but that's not why he came. The reason why he came the first time was so that he could die as a suffering servant that he would die on a cross as a payment for your sins and for my sins. And so what Satan is offering him here is a kingdom without the cross. And in fact, the words, three words are used in here, and they may sound familiar. Kingdom, power, and glory. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Satan says, I want to offer you kingdom, power, and glory. Whoa. Now think about this. He doesn't even say, if you are the son of God. He's completely dropped that whole line. And now he's just going right for the jugular. He's going right straight for the heart of the matter. And he's just calling, he's calling Jesus to just bow down and worship him. And he says, Jesus, all you have to do, you fall at my feet, you worship. You know I have the ability to give it all to you right now. I'll do it. You know, Satan always wants to confuse grace. Notice the language that he uses. I will give you all of this if you worship me. Grace doesn't ask in return. Doesn't, grace doesn't say, you know, I will give you a gift if you Grace gives. But Satan always wants to come and he wants to use the language of grace and he'll always throw in something that you have to do. And our world is completely confused on this whole idea and we just don't, we don't trust anything that says, I'm going to give you something, no strings attached. I'm going to love you, no strings attached we automatically have this wall, this barrier that we put up, and God calls us to lower the barrier, to put down the wall, put out, down our defenses, and to trust him. Satan always wants to blur that line, and every religion he's founded in the world is based off of works. And some of those religions even use language grace. They make you think it's about grace. But when you peel back the layers, it's all about works. Christianity is not a religion. It wasn't founded by men. It's not about men. Christianity is a relationship with God. Christianity is about the solution to your sin, period. It's the truth. It's all about Jesus and what he's done, and what he wants to give you.
Or was this a legitimate temptation? You know, Satan comes and he shows him all the kingdoms of the world in, in, a, in a moment in time. And he says, Jesus, you know, I'll give all of this to you. And some people have thought, like, this is a bum deal. Like, why would Jesus go for this? This isn't even real. The truth of the matter is, it, it is. And the Apostle Paul would tell you very clearly that he is, Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He is the God of this world. He is the one who has taken everybody captive to do his will. He is in charge. How did he get in charge? Adam was given dominion over the garden and the animals in the garden and over the creation. And what did he do? He turned it right over to Satan. And one of the things that Jesus has come to do is to win back for us everything that was lost by Adam. And that's exact. And if you notice, this whole account parallels in a lot of ways Genesis 3 and the first Adam and his failure when he was tempted by Satan. And now the second Adam will stand him down and he will be victorious. But Satan's all about worship. And in fact, I think that Satan would give pretty much anything you wanted if you were willing to worship him. You know, you know, it, it's become a little bit of a joke or in 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 media and movies and you know, popular culture to say stuff like, I sold my soul to the devil. But you know what? You talk to somebody who's actually done that or, you know, been around somebody who's done that. That's a very real thing. Don't joke about stuff like that. Don't mess around with stuff like that. Don't open up doors to Satan because he will come through them. And then in verse 10, then Jesus said unto him, get thee behind me, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only thou shalt serve. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Jesus' defense number three was Deuteronomy 6.13. You shall worship the Lord thy God, and him only will you serve. And from a human perspective, Jesus is just saying, like, look, I know my Bible, and I know that I'm not supposed to worship you. I don't worship angels. I don't want worship other human beings. I don't worship myself. I worship only God. Him only will I serve. And he's drawing the line in the sand and with authority, too. Get thee behind me, Satan. But from a divine perspective, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shall thou serve. Satan, you should be worshiping me, not the other way around. And I want you to notice that Satan doesn't go away forever. It's not like, you know, this was the temptation, this was the showdown, and now it's over, and Jesus is like, I'm glad that was over. That was kind of hard, and um, glad I don't have to do that again. No, this was a snapshot. This was maybe, you know, a, a very intense, strategic thing that the Holy Spirit was doing in the life of Jesus. And um, I think maybe to show Satan up a little bit. But don't make any mistakes. Satan just doesn't go away. And the other thing I want to clarify before we wrap up here is, you know, the idea that Satan personally is after you or that he's personally tempting you, is probably a long shot. You think about the number of human beings that are on the face of the earth and uh, all of the, the demons that Satan has at his disposal, and the odds that Satan is going to find you particularly the most strategic use of his time is probably a real long shot. Now, he does have real demon forces that... Um, Angels outnumber them, so don't get freaked out about them, okay? Don't give him too much credit, and don't uh, ignore that he exists. He's a very real person, and I want to emphasize a person. He is not, um, you know, a figment of our imagination. He's not just a projection of our, you know, 
our subconscious or that wicked side of us or that kind of thing. Satan is real. He is a real person. He really does exist. He really will be judged in the end. And uh, if you're on Jesus' side, you don't need to worry about him anyway. But get this, temptation is real. But here's the better thing. Paul says that no temptation is overtaking you except which is common to man. But God is faithful and he won't allow you to be tempted above that which you are able. So praise God. And so if you're here and you don't know Jesus, you're not on the right side. I don't know how to say it any clearer. If you don't know Jesus, if you don't know you're forgiven of your sins, if you don't know at this moment that you would go to heaven when you die, then you can settle it right now. It's a gift that he's extending out to you and he wants to give you. It's yours for the taking. All you have to do is between you and God and your own words is say, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. Please save me. I trust in you and you alone to save me. Please save me. And in a moment, we're going to have a baptism. We're going to have two people being baptized today. And I invite you, as I always do, if you came here and you didn't even know that that was going on, but you said, right now, I want to publicly proclaim my faith in Jesus. Whether you're a believer and you've just never been baptized or you right this moment, you said, I want to accept Jesus as my Savior. What you're saying right now, it makes sense. And let me tell you, if it's making sense, that's not me. That's God. He's, he's drawing you to himself. Don't harden your heart. Respond. Receive what God wants to give you. And you can come. You can do it in your own clothes. I promise we'll all be rooting for you. We're all on your side. And uh, But if you're a believer, temptation's real, but Jesus is greater. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And with the word of God, you can face him now. Every time, Jesus has given you everything you need for life and godliness. He's given you everything he, he has to give you. He, had, he held nothing back. And you can overcome temptation, no matter what it is, no matter what it is you're facing. You can beat it in Jesus. And I just want to assure you with that, Jesus was our example. And because he was our example, he's our faithful high priest. We talked about that when we went through Hebrews, that he's there to sympathize with you in your time of need. He's there to give you the grace that you need in your time of need. So praise God. Jesus said, freely you have received, freely give. And so if you go to www.peopleofthefreegift.com, you can access all of our articles, all of our videos, all of our podcasts, and everything else our ministry has to offer completely for free. For those who are in a position who are led of the Lord, we do appreciate your donations, and you can do so through that same website. We'd love to connect with you, and so you can catch up with us through the website, through Facebook, through Twitter, Google+, and Pinterest. And we'd love to hear your ideas, your comments, your questions for future podcasts.